So I'm going to finish, continue to finish this series, this seven-part series on the last seven words. So ever since we've had Passion Week and Resurrection Sunday, I've been teaching this series on the last seven words, hopefully bringing into our lives the value of Jesus' words that he spoke from that cross so that we can understand him even further and his ministry more completely. So turn with me to John chapter 19, verse 28. And uh, the title today is, It is Finished. This is the sixth word from the cross, which means next week we finish this series with the final word. But each one of these has been uh, revealing in the character of God. And that's what we want to see today. John 19, 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The last three words of Christ on the cross were kind of one long sentence within a few breaths. But they all have unique things. That's why last week I taught on I thirst. Because it's such an important revelation of the character of God and the fact that he poured himself out for us. So his last words from the cross, in a, in a, uh, just to tie them all together, uh, even though they were all strained through the long suffering and the searing pain, they were filled with life. They were filled with love and hope, and they were filled with fulfillment. And we see that over and over as it's written in the scriptures, it's fulfillment. So these last seven words from the cross express Jesus' divinity and his humanity. And we need to see that in our lives every day. He became one of us. And they all serve to accomplish his ultimate purpose of reconciling humanity back to God. So as we've seen in this series, his last words from the cross are both prophetic in their fulfillment and revealing in their nature. So today we're going to look at this sixth word. It is finished. Again, each word has revealed things about Jesus. The first one, Father, forgive them, reveals his ministry is captured. His ministry, his complete ministry is captured in this first word from the cross. Father, forgive them. It's a ministry of intercession. And then the second word, today you will be with me in paradise, reveals his compassion and his hope for failed humanity. It's heard in the second word is to the penitent thief who asked him to remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus' ministry was received, a promise of compassion and hope. So his ministry of intercession and his ministry received. And then thirdly, we see behold your mother. And the message that I brought on that reveals his concern. His concern for his mother, his responsibility as the firstborn in his family. It's heard in this word as he's spoken to, as spoken to John for his mother. Behold your mother. So Jesus' concern and his provision are revealed in this third word. And then we see in the, the fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus' dark day of the soul when he took the sin of the world upon himself. It's hard to comprehend that sense of feeling of being forsaken when sin was laid upon him. We get a sense of it every time we feel sin in our lives. We feel like God has gone away when he hasn't. We feel forsaken. We feel abandoned, but God never leaves us nor forsakes us. And then last week we saw, I thirst. And I referenced John 7, 37. Remember on the last day of the feast, the great day, he stood up as the high priest was getting ready to pour out the water from the silver pitcher, the libation of worship to God, he says, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And the one who, was, who is the living water, who poured himself out for us, is poured out. And he says, I thirst. So this was a prophetic picture, but it was, uh, it was revealing. It was also his nature. I mean, he was, he was dying of thirst. He was suffocating So these are Jesus' final acts, his final hours, his final words of his earthly ministry before his resurrection and his ascension. It is finished. The Greek word there is tetelestai. Now, I'm not all Greeky and everything, but I I love to read and study the original language because you get so much insight. But this word tetelestai 
was cried out. Now, just, this wasn't a cry of defeat. This was a cry of victory. Tetelestai. He says, it is finished. And this was a word that was common to everybody in that day because I don't know about you, but I, I remember the first time that I got a statement from the bank that said my car was paid off. Tetelestai. Paid in full. That's what we want. We want that paid in full. I remember the first time we paid off the house. <laughs> paid in full. You're no longer in debt. Anybody know what that feels like? It's a great feeling. Yeah, you ought to aim for it because liberty comes with it. But this is what Jesus was saying. The debt has been paid in full. Tell, tell us that. It is finished. What is finished? The work of God. The Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. It is is finished. Jesus, after this, knowing that all things had been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. Well, we know he was fulfilling that humanity and the expression of the physical need, but also the reality of his pouring out of his life. And then when it's all done, he says, it is finished. I just love the reality. I love the closure. You know, there's, there's so much frustration in life already when things just never seem to come to a close. It's like elections. You know, it's like you just finished it and they're already talking about the next one. It's like, turn it off. But, you know, I've been involved in missions very heavily since 1982. And I can remember how frustrated I got with evangelism and missions because it was like, it didn't matter how much I got done. There was so much more to do. And then when I really got involved in missions, started studying about how many unreached peoples there were and all these different languages and nations and boundaries. And I remember the revelation that God gave me because I had this feeling. Have you ever seen this? They, they, they do this on beaches on TV and some youth camps and things, but they have a, a volleyball that's like 10 foot in diameter. You can't pick it up if you try because every time you get your hands and it just pinches right out. And so they, they, they have this game where they play with this great big ball. And that's what I felt like everything with God was like, I can't get my hands around it. It's just too big. There's too much to it. And, and every time I started to get a grip on something, it pops out, you know, and, and there was no sense of closure. And then in the late 80s, the, there was a mission movement that was called AD 2000. And the fact was that there was a sense of closure. Matthew 24, 14, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached to all the nations as a witness, then the end will come. There is closure. God does have a plan to say, it is finished. Now, we all have that in our lives. And as Wally was referring to this morning, uh, you, you do have the, the prize for having circled the sun more than anybody else in the room. There's a few that are trying to catch up, but anyway, the fact is that, that, that we are going to hear that too. It is finished. And then what we want to hear is that divine accolade, well done, good and faithful servant. See, that's the goal of a Christian is to please God and to have that reality to finish well. I mean, here it is Father's Day, and what's the biggest failure of most men? We abdicate our authority as a spiritual head, and we don't finish well. We want to finish well. I want to hear, I mean, more than anything, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. When I was meeting with the Life Mission Church a couple of weeks ago, I told them, I said, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years. I said, and this is hard ground. I know when you work in an urban church, it's hard ground. You, you talk to thousands of people, and you produce very little fruit. But you know what? My, 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 my heart isn't, I mean, I would love to see all the people who have said yes, all the people who've been prayed for. We would, this building would, could not hold them. Even if we had three services, it would not hold them. But I know I have been faithful in what God told me to do. Our church has been faithful in our assignment. We still continue to pray for those 27,000 families around our church. And you know what? God's going to say, faithful, well done good and faithful servant. That's my heart. Now, I want to see fruit. Oh, gosh, I want to see fruit. My, my ministry is all about fruit that remains. I want something that's going to last. And so I know I'm sowing. You know, vision is always out of reach. When you live your life, you live with things that are just out of reach. If you can reach your vision, it's not really a vision. It's just like a little daily assignment. But when you have something that's too big and you're always stretching for it, that's what moves you along in life. And that's what God calls us to. So I can remember when I had this vision, this idea of closure that came out of Matthew 24, 14. When this gospel of the kingdom is preached to all the nations as a witness, then the end will come. There is closure. And when you read through scripture, God knows it's called a Kairos event in the fullness of time. 
Only the Lord understands this, and we trust him. And so we just continue on in faithfulness so that we'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, you got, you got 200,000 people into the, brought in the kingdom, you know, or 10 people, or a church of 5,000. You know, that's not it. That, it's not it at all. It's being faithful in the little things. Jesus said, and here he is, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundations, looked like a loser, beaten, bruised, bloodied, naked, hanging in a public forum to die. People were yelling at him, wagging their fingers at him, wagging who knows all the stuff they were saying at him, and, and he looked like a loser, but he's a winner. And he knew what he was doing. That's why these last seven words are so important. He said, it is finished. He accomplished the very thing that was on the Father's heart. So Jesus' passion is complete. He swallowed up sin, and he's also going to swallow up death and the grave once he descends into the place of the dead and fills death with himself and leads captivity captive into the presence of God. It is finished, telestai, paid in full. So you've got this big red stamp, the mark of God on you, paid in full. You're covered. You're covered. You're under the umbrella, the propitiation of God's grace against the judgment of the world. You are covered. We were talking in our discipleship class this morning about, um, Andy brought, some, brought it up about somebody who had a tattoo. And they said, well, you know, the scripture says if you have a tattoo, you know, you can't, you can't be saved, you can't, be, you can't get cleansed. You can't. It's like, no, that's not the unforgivable sin, especially in today. If that's the case, we lost a whole generation. I had my nephew was bragging about these new tattoos on the back of his legs, and he's this big muscular guy. And he was like, somebody took pictures of the back of his legs, and he had these beautiful trees with roots going down and all this stuff. So I typed on there, he says, that looks really cool. These are going to be weeping willows when you're 60. <laughs> It's like, don't even talk to me about that. <laughs> you know, all these things people have all over their arms. It just looks, it looks like it's going to look like somebody <laughs> smeared something on them later, you know, because the, the skin is the largest organ, and it doesn't do well with time, okay? Um, <laughs> Hallelujah. It is finished. You know, there is no unforgivable sin except to reject the source of our forgiveness, the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin to reject the Holy Spirit. But it, it, I, I remember I was brought up in the 50s and 60s. If you were a divorced Catholic, you, you had to hide in the back of the church. You couldn't take communion. You were excommunicated. You couldn't receive grace. No, God doesn't do that to us. He, he has his arms wide open. He's the father that says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. No one is excluded. Everyone is invited, and he has his arms wide open for us. You may feel like the prodigal, but God is looking for you. He's got his eyes open. And Jesus says, with his arms wide open, it is finished. I've paid the price. It is done. You are taken care of in me. So in me, you can have all that I am. And he invites us. And that's what we celebrate here today, is his finished work. So he proclaims this. He yells it out. To Telestai, again, it's not a cry of defeat, it was a cry of victory. See, in him we are victorious. His ordeal was over. The consummation of his suffering, all of the revelation of judgment that we see in the book of Revelation has fallen on Jesus Christ. And those who are in him, the scripture makes very clear, God has marked as bondservants and will watch over, protect, and keep them. Hope, hope, hope. See, if you're, not, if you're not in him, you don't have any hope. He's the one that took the judgment. But if you reject him, you get to have it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the right unrighteousness of men. I mean, it's there. that's why the world is broken. We live in bodies destined to die. We have no hope in ourselves. Our own hope is only found in him. And he says, it is finished. Paid in full. You're covered. This is what the Lord wants us to know. This is what he wants us to think about. His final accomplishment of his father's will. 
he gave himself sacrifice for sin. The complete fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. That's why the scripture says, as it was written. Everything from the beginning, the announcement of that proto-prophecy in Genesis 3.15, that, 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 that the seed of the woman would crush the head, that God was going to provide a, a remedy and a victor. That promise given at the beginning, at Adam's fall, is now realized and satisfied on that cross when he says, it is finished. Now, when we have our Good Friday service, and I remind people during that time that there but that Passover meal, Jesus is our Passover. He fulfilled that whole feast in himself. He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. But when we have that Passover meal, there were four cups of the meal, four things to remember. And it's actually uh, recognizing a scripture. There's the cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the cup of righteousness. So Exodus 6, 6 to 9 becomes the, the format for remembering and for celebrating what God has provided for us. The first cup, the cup of sanctification, reflects God's first promise in Exodus 6. It says that I will free you from your oppression. So when God says it is finished, he has freed us from oppression. We do not need to continue in defeat. We do not need to continue in depression. We do not need to continue in a spirit of suicide. We do not need to continue in poverty. We do not need to continue in hopelessness. We do not need to continue in sin. He says, it is finished. He provided in him that means of sanctification, of being made holy. That's what sanctification means. Set apart from sin, set apart to God. The second cup, the cup of deliverance, reflects God's second promise, I will rescue you, rescue from your slavery. God will deliver us. Whatever, whatever entangles you right now, whatever binds you up right now, sometimes it's a way of thinking. Sometimes it's things that we do. Sometimes there are habits in our lives. We just think, I, I, I've tried. I really hate this. But, you know, I, I, grew up, I grew up smoking when I was a kid. I started smoking very young. And I remember when, you know, in my 20s, I just hated it. Now, in the Army, it was a break, because if you got them, smoke them, you know? And uh, so you want a break, you smoke cigarettes. <laughs> there was guys who started, lots of people started smoking in the Army just so they could take a break, you know? Because if you got them, smoke them. But I can remember when I was in school, after I got out, and I was going to, going to school, get my engineering, and I, I, I just hated the fact that I, you know, I wanted to quit smoking. I just hated it. But I just kept doing it. And then, of course, I was going to school over in North Kansas City and Burlington Road. You could get gas cheap and cigarettes cheap. And I said, I'll never pay more than 30 cents a pack for cigarettes. Well, every place else was 50 cents, but over there it was still 30. <laughs> so and when I graduated in 76, I was no longer driving over there every week. And see, when you're stingy, it's really easy to quit something that costs money. So... <laughs> No, I just remember I hated it for five years. I even tried to quit a few times. And I hated the fact that my boys were being brought up in a house where the smoker, because they're breathing it every day. My wife grew up in a house that way, but it didn't seem to bother her, and, and she was used to me smoking. But I still hated it. Well, there are sins in our lives that are much more detrimental than smoking a cigarette. Much more detrimental. And, and some of them are leading to perdition itself. I mean, you're on a slippery road. But any of these habits that we know are destructive to us, that are offensive to us and to others, and, and, and offensive even to God's plan and purpose, because this is the temple of God. The, but those things will overwhelm us. The scripture says, he came to deliver us, the cup of deliverance. I will rescue you from your slavery. Jesus said, it is finished. This is something you need to memorize when that thing raises its ugly head one more time and that stuff comes out of your mouth or you, things that you follow or you pursue, you need to remember, Jesus said, it is finished. He's provided the cup of deliverance. And then the third cup is the cup of redemption. This is one we celebrate, our communion cup. It's a, it's a third promise. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. The cup of blessing, the Hegelah. This is the one God's blessing comes in our lives, and, and, and you want to receive that blessing. That's called grace. That's what Wally was talking about this morning. Yeah, his son David was bragging on him, but he's saying, yes, it's all God. Grace, 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 grace. Well, you need that grace to walk in victory, and he wants to provide that grace, the cup of blessing. And the fourth cup is the cup of righteousness that remembers the final blessing. God's promise that I will claim you as my own people. I will be your God. 
See, Jesus had introduced and opened up God's amazing mystery of redemption. Even though the disciples didn't understand it. But Jesus still had to drink that fifth cup, and that's what the passion is all about. Jesus said, it is finished. Stand up with me, please. Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Isn't that encouraging? I'm going to close by reading these two verses, and these verses are intended to stir our hearts to act. I don't usually just try to draw people up here to see how many people I can come forward, but I think there are two different ways that we need to respond to God's announcement that it is finished. The first one's in Romans six, Romans 5, 6 to 11. It says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will ha- hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There are many Christians who have not taken advantage of what Jesus has provided. They live their lives bound up inhibited, feeling guilty of being a hypocrite, wondering if they really are saved even. And God says, I paid the price, the ultimate price. All you need to do is receive. Jesus says, it is finished. And then the second scripture is from Hebrews 4 that I've been referencing through this series, that we need to remember that therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus became sin for us. He opened the door and he says, come boldly before my throne to receive mercy and grace. Brothers and sisters, it's time to get real with God, to take advantage of his invitation to come boldly before his throne, but also to realize that you don't need to be straddling the fence with your faith, trying to be in the world, but not of it, but becoming of the world, but not in it. God wants us to draw near and take advantage. He says, it is finished. Now, faith requires action. And that's why altar calls have become popular in the last hundred years in the church. It wasn't before that, but it is now because it's, a, it's an outward way to take action. Now, I'm not going to do a public thing here, but I want to do this. I'm going to ask Pastor John and other people from the prayer team, if they'll come up and just be over here. If you need someone to pray for you, I'll be here. My wife will be here. If you need someone to pray for you, we'll pray for you. But if you just want to come up and just bow your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to receive what you have provided. You said it's finished. I want to be free. Or you say, God, you said come boldly before the throne. I have a need. So I don't know which one is which. Only the Lord knows your hearts. But brothers and sisters, don't walk out of here the same way you came in. But respond to the Holy Spirit. So Father, I thank you that you give us your word, that you've provided your promises, that Jesus, you completed the work. You are the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. You knew what it was going to cost before you even started. You were the wise master builder who counted the cost, and you knew it was going to cost you to have people who love you by choice. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that people would choose to receive what you have provided and enter into all that you have for them. And those who are in need right now, whatever that might be, it might be physical or financial or, or family or whatever, whatever it is, and they, you say, come boldly before my throne to receive mercy and grace. There's nothing here any man can provide, but you have provided everything as the Lamb of God, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, Lord make his face shine on you, and give you his peace. If you want that, say amen.